Sorry. I'm Stephanie Harris. Um, I've been growing for 51 years and uh, started out as a gardener, then as a homesteader, and then as a market gardener on my small farm here in Hopewell, New Jersey. And I'm one of the founding board members of NOFA New Jersey, currently the secretary of the board. And Al forgot to mention that he is our esteemed vice president of the board. Um, so we're really glad to be here tonight. And I wanted to get started with just a very brief introduction, and then we're going to go into uh, question and answer. So as uh, Nagisa pointed out in the, the pictures that she's already shown us, so it all starts in the soil. And just as our gut microbiome is, uh, keeps us healthy, so does the soil microbiome allow the plants to be healthy and to fight off diseases and pests. But uh, nonetheless, you still, especially in wet years, will get disease pressure. And there are several things that you can do in order to minimize uh, the problems of disease. The first is sanitation. And that means uh, cleaning up all of the debris from last year's crops, uh, making sure that any uh, leaves uh, that are diseased or plants that are diseased are removed from the garden so that the spores cannot transfer to other plants. And uh, don't forget to wash all of your equipment before you use it and you can wash it with a 10% bleach solution. So that would include any seedling uh, planters um, and any tomato stakes or cages, any black plastic. All of this should be sanitized before it's put in the garden. And by doing that, you're able to minimize uh, the amount of uh, microbes that are going into your garden. When you're planting, you should remember that ventilation is incredibly important. And so you don't want to put your crops too close together because then the wind cannot blow through them and uh, you have a much greater likelihood of disease. You also want to water your plants if you're watering overhead, water them early in the day so that the leaves have an opportunity to dry out. But a much better way of watering is with drip irrigation so that the leaves never do get wet. And then mulching is really important because you want to be able to uh, prevent the soil and the microbes that are in the soil uh, from splashing up on your plants, especially your tomato plants when it rains. And so if you have a mulch, uh, that will be a barrier between the soil and your uh, foliage. Crop rotation is really important. Uh, because there are many uh, diseases that will remain in the soil from year to year. So if you are planting your nightshade family, such as tomatoes, eggplant, potatoes, and peppers, you don't want to put them in the same place in the garden year after year. Because if you had a problem with, let's say, anthracnose in your soil one year, it's going to be there in the following years. So be sure to rotate your families throughout the garden. Um, you can use beneficial organisms in order to combat some of the disease organisms. Uh, there are products like Shield and Actinovate, which uh, take microbes, beneficial microbes, put them in the soil, and those will compete with um, the microbes that are going to cause disease. And you can also have beneficial organisms that are sprayed uh, as a foliar spray. You can use a compost tea or a product called Serenade, which uh, is Bacillus subtilis, and uh, that bacterium will outcompete uh, microorganisms. And then if, if all else fails, you can use sprays. And there are mineral sprays that are uh, acceptable for organic gardening and farming. And those are usually based on sulfur or copper. And other types of sprays are uh, being developed and put on the market 
currently. You have some herbal sprays, uh, peroxide based and bicarbonate based, and also oil sprays can suffocate certain microbes that uh, would cause powdery mildew. Um, as far as pest control goes, it's really important to know the insect that you're dealing with and know its life cycle so that you're able to hit it at the right time. And you also want to be aware of the fact that you're not going to be able to eradicate every single pest in your garden. And so you have to decide, well, what is the economic threshold? What can I accept uh, to be the uh, level of disaster that happens in my garden? And it might be that uh, you have some pests that will demolish one plant, but that's it. But if the number of pests increase, then you definitely will lose all your plants and you want to act. Um, the first thing that you can do is use barriers. And a barrier would be something that is put between the plant and the pest. So what I usually use are row covers. And uh, these are uh, polyethylene um, uh, covers that are used to extend the season but it comes in very, very thin uh, cl uh, cloth, and that can be used during the height of the summer, uh, and that will protect your plants from the pests. But uh, if it is a plant that has to be pollinated, the row cover has to be taken off when the plant flowers. Um, you can use netting and fencing against larger pests like birds and uh, deer, and raccoons and groundhogs. So barriers are very important. Traps are also uh, very useful. I have a uh, squirrel relocation program going on at my place right now using my have a heart trap, catching squirrels like crazy and uh, taking them at least three miles away so that uh, they can feast on uh, some other vegetation and not on my fruit. Um, so have a heart traps can be used on wildlife, but uh, you can also find pheromone traps uh, or floral scent lures in, in sticky traps that uh, will lure the bug in and they will get stuck on um, a sticky substance, which is on cardboard or plastic. Um, you can use sticky tape around the base of trees so that any pests that normally would be crawling up a tree uh, would get stuck on the tape. Or um, you can use tanglefoot either directly on the tree or paint it on fake apples, for instance, and uh, that would attract apple maggots and they get stuck to the tanglefoot. Then there are the scare tactics, mostly for wildlife. And you might have seen some of these large balloons that have two giant eyes painted on them, which is supposed to scare off the birds. Uh, you can also buy plastic owls and snakes. And uh, if that fails, and oftentimes it'll work for a while, but then after a while the birds get used to it, then you can put down what's called bird scare tape. And that is like a mylar tape and you string it along the top of whatever it is you're trying to protect, be it your tomato patch or your berry patch. And um, when the wind blows, it makes a rustling noise that seems to scare the birds. And I did that plus hang strips of the mylar tape from those um, long strands and after I finished, I would say that my garden looked like a used car sales lot, but it did scare away the birds. Then um, you can try water sprays and a uh, good strong spray from a water hose uh, will oftentimes uh, remove aphids and whiteflies from plants and you don't have to use anything else in the water. But if that doesn't work, you can add a soap solution, uh, which is uh, a good way to attack soft-bodied insects. 
You can also use oil sprays, which will suffocate the eggs. Uh, they're used as dormant oil sprays, but you can have it in a, a more dilute form during the growing season and suffocate eggs and also soft-bodied insects with an oil spray. Hot pepper wax sprays um, will repel uh, insects and uh, herbal sprays will as well. As a final um, resort, you can go to biologically based insecticides. You want to try to use the type of insecticide that is most specific to the pest class that you are dealing with so that it's not a broad spectrum and you're not destroying all of the beneficial insects in your garden. And so um, some of them are based on pyrethrum or neem, and those are broad spectrum or a, uh, a more targeted uh, pesticide would be spinosad, which is a uh, biological insect, uh, or Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt. And those are mostly for the Lepidoptera family, which are your moths and um, uh, caterpillars. Finally, you want to be able to attract parasites and predators to your garden. And uh, one way of attracting them is to plant um umbiliferous plants, which are the flowering uh, part of fennel and parsley and um, Queen Anne's lace, uh, any of these plants that have like an umbrella-like uh, flower to it, and those will attract uh, many beneficial insects. So um, those are some of the things that you can do. There are a whole host more, but Al is going to tell us all about parasites and predators and try to introduce us to some of them. So Al, I turn it over to you. Sure. There's some questions coming through. Um, <clears throat> I, I, we're really hoping this could be discussion. So I do have some, some slides to show, uh, but um, should we take those questions first? That's fine. Sure. You wanna read, you wanna read them, man? Absolutely. So uh, Kathleen wanted to know if you had any advice for what you should do uh, in the midst of like a tropical storm. Uh, should I have uh, used a row cover to protect my tomato plants? Well, the storm is going to blow off your row cover and tear it to shreds. So I don't think that's going to be useful. But because tomatoes tend to crack when they have uh, an excess of water, uh, it would be very wise to remove any tomatoes that are ripe or near ripe uh, so that you can save them from the onslaught of the rain. Um. In addition to that, I actually have a, an additional question for that. I have uh, tomato cages, uh, as we saw earlier this week, and I found with the wind, it really bruised and damaged the, the branches and stems. Is there anything I could put around almost the rings to kind of buffer that, or is that just a symptom of what I'm using? Well, uh, it would seem to me that um, it's, it's so unusual to have a storm with that force of wind that it would not be worth your while to try to uh, put any kind of covering on the wire. So you just have to deal with it. But um, for the cages, oftentimes they'll get blown over by the wind. Mm -hmm. And the best thing to do is to put metal stakes in your garden about every four feet and then tie the cages to the stakes and then tie the cages to each other uh, so that you have this network that's holding up the cages and that might prevent more damage so that if the cages uh, remain upright, then uh, you won't have stems that are damaged when the cages are blown over. Thank you. Yeah, Kathleen's question said she actually was talking about salt water, not just water. Um, I guess the salt in the water spray from from the hurricane. So, and I think the question was, would, would the row covers help for that? And I would say, no, they don't. Water, air, whatever, they go right through them. Um, I, <laughs> I've never lived on the ocean, so I, I don't have any experience protecting 
you know, but, it, but in the long run, if you had a good, uh, you know, good buffer, uh, something like arborvitae trees or something like that along, you know, between yourself and the ocean, I would think that would help a lot with reducing the spray, but that's a, a long-term solution, not a short-term one. I would think that you could also try to uh, just spray clear, clean water on the plants after the storm passes so that you're spraying off all of that salt water. So there's a question also about uh, traps for have a heart. I can answer that for the big ones, but I don't, I don't have a squirrel sized trap. Uh, I, I always think for the big ones, the best thing is cantaloupe, but that would be to try to catch groundhogs. Um, but uh, one of the things, uh, um, what are they, uh, possums and raccoons, which are not necessarily a pest, but they like, they like cantaloupe too. Um, I've tried, you know, when, when I don't have cantaloupe, I've tried other things, whatever is available. Uh, and it's usually during the fruit season that, that we have problems with them. So there's plenty of different types of fruit. But I would say fruit for uh, larger animals. What about the squirrels, Stephanie? Uh, well, the squirrels were eating my peaches. So uh, since I know that they like peaches, that's what I put in my trap. Mm -hmm. And I put it right under the peach tree. So the squirrels thought that this was just their ordinary snack and they went right in. <laughs> um, I've also used peanut butter extensively uh, on smaller rodents as well as on the squirrels. And peanut butter is irresistible. So it looks like we have, um, in addition to that, a question about stink bugs. Is that something we're going to be going over in the friend or foe presentation? No, it's not. Okay, so why don't we cover that and then we'll, we'll dive into the presentation. Uh, Mary was wondering how she can eliminate stink bugs. Uh, they were on my peas earlier in the season, and now they're on her uh, zucchini and yellow squash plants. Do you want to try for that one, Al? I don't have experience. I haven't had, pro I haven't had, knock on wood, lanternfly or, or um, stink bugs in my garden. I mean, I have some in my house, but they've never bothered the garden. I, I, I do want to make a comment, though, if somebody can, can more directly answer Mary with stink bugs. Charlie? Do you have any idea? No experience with them in the garden. Again, yeah. they're in the house. Right. In the house. And I'm, I'm just wondering if she is identifying them correctly, if they are stink bugs or if they're squash bugs, because squash uh, bugs look was... very similar to stink bugs, only they're gray instead of brown. Yeah. Um, uh, would you qualify that as a soft insect, maybe the soap? Uh, I've never tried it, so I don't know if it works. You know, you can always use a broad spectrum uh, pesticide like neem, mm -hmm. and um, that should eliminate any pest. So, but Mary, if it, was, if it was on the peas early in the season, I would guess that they were stink bugs. Uh, however, what you're seeing on the squash now is much more likely to be the squash bug. Yeah. And the way to tell, I mean, one easy way to tell them apart is the stink bugs are always the same size. Whereas when you see squash bugs, they tend to cluster and, and they only go after, you know, the, the squash family, you know, includes cucumbers, melons, whatever. Um, and there'll be, there'll be clusters of them, but they'll be all different sizes and they're always gray. Stink bugs are more brown, uh, well, gray and black, you know, various shades of gray and black. And I have used a broad spectrum on those. Um, I think I use the spinosad, uh, which is a bacterial spray, but, uh, you know, other things could work too. And, um, and I, I do it because they're always in a cluster. So you don't have to spray the whole garden. All you have to do is spray one leaf. You, quite often they're all on one leaf. So I don't know if that rings a bell. You want to unmute yourself, Mary, and, and um, make a comment? Hello. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, early in the season, <clears throat> they definitely smell like stink bugs because we have them in the house, but not a lot but there was a lot in the garden. Hmm. I mean, I was picking peas and they were all over the peas and now we're picking zucchini and even tomatoes and they're all <laughs> over the um, grape tomatoes. Um, well, the, the good thing about stink bugs is that they move very slowly. So it's very easy to pick them off and just yes. get a bucket of soapy water and just keep popping them into the soapy water. Yeah, but there's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm going to try the neem oil. I think Al had mentioned the neem oil. Yeah. See if yeah. that can eliminate them. Yeah. 
Thank you. And, and you'll be the expert after this. Okay. <laughs> I'll tell you how it goes. Yeah. yeah, it seems like there's such a big problem that there should be a, a pheromone trap. I mean, because that would be the other really sort of big ah. would be because the I know the Japanese beetles, those pheromone traps are so powerful. They really pull them in. But I haven't seen any, I haven't looked, but I haven't seen any kind of pheromone trap for a uh, stink bug. Might be worth okay. looking for one. Okay. Thank I'm you. not sure that they're made because people have so many problems inside the house. You would think that somebody would come up with a trap. Yeah. But I have never seen one advertised. Okay. In case okay. anybody's interested, we're down in Gloucester County. Ah. Uh, and just land of the stink bugs. <laughs> loaded, just lo but not in the house. They're on the plants in the garden. Ooh. Huh. So, do they seem to like the shade or the sun or like can is there anything consistent uh, in the microclimate that you can identify well i'm thinking now that you're mentioning that the tomatoes the zucchini everything's in the sun yeah yeah, yeah. we've certainly had them on the tomatoes and they puncture the tomato they're really uh, very annoying yes i'm sure and they're doing the same on the squash as i'm picking them they're like on my hands <laughs> and they smell, you know, like they smell like a stink bug. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure that's what they are. Well, Al, maybe you should go into uh, sure. your photographs so that yeah. you can learn and, to identify. Uh, my kind of original intention was that uh, everybody, I welcome anybody to unmute themselves. Um, and um, uh, I, I call this presentation friend or foe. <laughs> Laura, are you all set to share the, share your screen? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I think this is probably, uh, I think we all know what this is, even though you can only see the head. It's, it's a praying mantis, and obviously it's the friend. So, Laura, go ahead. Okay, anybody want to yell out what this one is? <laughs> Amanda, if he's going to ask for people to guess, I think you need to unmute everybody. Okay. We'll see how that works. <laughs> okay, let's try it for one, because otherwise they can't participate. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, pay attention, okay. otherwise so, Dr. Al might call. Do we, have a, do we have a volunteer who wants to tell us what this is? No idea. Is that a, it looks kind of like a color. Oh, on, Stephanie, you can't, you can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that it's not on the, on the type of crop that it, it normally would be a pest. Yeah, you're right. And, and I didn't take this photo. I, I, I got it from an extension. It, it's a Colorado potato beetle. Um, and, and I'm not sure what kind of a crop it's on. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that you, uh, you, you want to be cautious of. I don't have a picture in here of its lava. Its lava will stay. It goes to four uh, insights, in state, uh, in stars, I think you call them. Uh, so the, I guess those aren't larvas, they're uh, what, nymphs or whatever. No, that's not right. But um, uh, it, it's, the, it's those stages that do the most damage. Um, but this is the adult. They're, they're slow moving. They're even slow moving at night. Uh, so they're fairly easy to pick and squash. But it depends on how, how big of a place, you, how, how many plants you have. OK, go ahead, Laura. OK, anybody? Friend. Friend, OK, right. Yeah, <laughs> ladybird bird. beetle, uh, ladybug, whatever you want to call it. and. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it particularly uh, goes after aphids and other small things like that, white, white flies. And I, I, think it, I think it's voracious stage is more in the larval stage, but um, it's certainly a friend. Okay, go ahead. Friend or foe? Oh. Oh, yeah. Striped cucumber beetle. There's also a version that's spotted. I think there just is, um, uh, usually the striped is more, uh, more prevalent, um, but their physical damage is not so bad as the fact that they will, will uh, spread disease from one crop to another and it um, seems to be mostly on cucumbers and members of that family. I think they're worse on, on cucumbers, but um, I'm sorry, Stephanie, the, the disease is, is, is uh, slipped my mind. What's the name of it? Um, well, the um, viral disease is the um, mosaic virus. Mm -hmm. Um, but they can also, um, I'm trying to remember. Charlie, can, Mike. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, viral, bacterial diseases. Uh, uh, bacterial wilt, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah, bacterial. yeah. And so, so quite often, uh, it, it won't be every plant. If you have, if you have a whole row of these, uh, uh, you'll, you'll all of a sudden, you'll get a couple of those plants that are just, they wilt. <laughs> and you know, a couple of late, days later, they'll dry out and die. So that's a, that's a sign that, uh, that the, the cucumber beetle has been around. And Stephanie, I think you use row covers to protect your, uh, Mike, maybe you, you and Charlie too, uh, to a certain age, I guess you have to take them off when the flower when they flower, pollinate, right. Right. Uh, so they can pollinate. But that at least gives them a head start, and uh, uh, we'll help them out. Okay, Laura. Ah, friend or foe? Hmm. Hmm. No idea. <laughs> foe. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's a Mexican bean uh, Mexican bean beetle. Um, it's the adult stage. Uh, and again, I think it's the larval stage that, um, that does most of the damage, but uh, they're fairly slow moving. They can be handpicked if you just have a small, a small plot. Uh, I tend to find, I'm, I actually don't plant much in the way of beans anymore, but I would find that some years they're really bad, some years you don't see one. Anybody else have any comments on that? Yeah, I agree with you there. And um, in New Jersey, there is a beneficial insect lab, and they have um, cultured the predator of the Mexican bean beetle, which um, if you are lucky enough, you can get a hold of. And um, you have to have a low level of the population of the bean beetle in order for the predator to survive. So you cannot destroy all of your bean beetles. Um, so you will not get a clean crop, uh, but it will help. Um, you can also use a broad spectrum spray like a pyrethrum or a neem oil on uh, the bean beetle. Um, they will completely destroy your bean plant and make it lacy such that there's almost no leaf left and then the plant dies. Okay. Um, Laura, any questions come in? Uh, nope, no, uh, no I, questions. I guess if everybody's muted, anybody, everybody in the chat. Unmute. Yeah, and everyone can unmute yourself, by the way, so you can shout out if it's a friend or foe and then ask, ask your questions as we, we truck through. Okay, go ahead, Laura. Okay, friend or foe? It's got to be foe. That's a foe. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've it seen is the those. Egg of the Colorado <laughs> potato beetle, and they're generally on the undersides of the leaves. I think. I'm not sure this is a potato leaf or a tomato leaf. Uh, uh, same family, they'll go after either of them, but they're much worse on, on potatoes. Uh, the Mexican bean beetle that we just, used, we just saw, their eggs look very similar. I think they may be a little bit smaller, but they, they are, are very similar, uh, which of course will be on the underside of the bean leaf. Okay. That used to be my job to scrape those off of the eggplants at the farm I used to work uh, at. Okay. <laughs> Friend or foe? Friend. Yeah, you're right, Mary. Um, this is actually the eggs of the green lace, green lacewing, which is a predator. And I, I, I've only actually seen this once. This is not my my photo. Uh, so they're not real common. Um, they are a good predator. I'm not sure exactly what they go after. Um, aphids. Uh, what's that? Oh, aphids. Okay. Aphids. They're yeah. also called aphid lions. Aphid lions. Okay. Yeah, and it's on the underside. I don't think it's on the underside of any particular leaf. I think they'll just lay them where, where they can, but very distinctive. Are they, you can buy them um, and introduce them to your garden. As larva? Um, they, they come uh, as, yeah, in the larval stage, and then as soon as they start hatching out and moving around, then you release them and um, if you have a lot of aphids, they'll stick around and eat them all up. Good. All right. Go ahead, Lar. Ah, friend or foe? Ooh. Uh -oh. Yeah, cut more. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this uh, it looks like it just cut through a piece of grass, which is, is kind of irrelevant. And generally, uh, we think of these as pests um, early in the season when we transplant tomatoes and, and, and other things like that. I actually had a problem last year. I, I, I plant 
late lettuce. I just, matter of fact, I just planted my last planting today. And the previous planting, I looked at it today and I noticed that, that there were a whole bunch of leaves that had been chewed off at the base. So, so in other words, if this was a lettuce plant, you look at that leaf coming up on the kind of the upper right hand side, that had been chewed off and, it, and there had been two or three of them chewed off and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a mammal. That, it didn't seem like it was a mammal that had done it. The same thing happened last year. And when I was, when I was weeding the next time, I found a, what looked to be a cutworm, it was just like this. Um, and I didn't realize that they were around this time of year. Um, but I, I think that's what's actually, I think they still are. And so I actually grow some fall brassicas and I will spray them with BT um, about every 10 days, two weeks. So now uh, I'm gonna go on a regimen of, of doing the same thing to the baby lettuce plants. Because uh, I did that last year and the damage stopped. So I, I think I was correct in it. It was damaged from a cutworm. You won't see them during the day. Uh, I'm going to go out tonight and see if I can find one. Um, hopefully after tonight, they'll die from the, from the BT. But um, uh, anybody have any more comments on, on this one? Yeah. Can I ask a question to Steffi? Go, go ahead, Charlie. Um, no, it's, it's, hi, Steph. Yeah. You said that there was a predator place in New Jersey. I live in New Jersey. Is that part of Rutgers or where do you get those predator insects? It was part of uh, New Jersey Department of Agriculture. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's called the Beneficial um, Lab or something okay. like that. I think it's in um, as, as far as, as the cutworm goes, um, if you uh, are creating a new garden on land that had been in sod, there uh, will probably be a lot of cutworms in that soil. And so it is recommended to use beneficial nematodes on the soil before you plant. Um, beneficial nematodes are microscopic, but they are a little army that goes to work eating all of these um, insects that are underground that uh, are going to come out and attack your plants. And uh, there are uh, beneficial nematodes that can be purchased and you uh, mix it with water and you spray it on the soil and you have to keep the soil very moist until they get established. But they will attack the cutworms. And if you especially are planting a new uh, garden that had been in sod, it's recommended that you do that first. Steph, let me ask you one thing though. Um you're, you're a fairly large scale. Um, I've looked into nematodes and found that they cost like $40 for the cheapest bag because I think they, they package them for farms. Uh, does anybody know a source that, that's small enough? Because I'd like to use them too, but I've just never found an affordable source. You know, <laughs> I'm not sure I have $40 worth of lettuce in the, <laughs> at one time. So. Yeah, um, you can also um, just use part of the bag and keep the rest in your refrigerator and then either uh, sell it to a friend, give it to a friend, or use it later on in the season. Thanks. Any, any more questions? Okay, Laura. Ah, friend or foe? Foe. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, according to me, yes. According to you, Mary, according to my neighbor, no. It, it actually is the lava of the, uh, black swallowtail butterfly, which is a beautiful butterfly. Unfortunately, it loves lettuce. I mean, I'm sorry, it loves carrots, it loves dill. Uh, it loves a lot of things that grow in the garden. So we, we, we kind of nicknamed it the carrot worm, I guess. Um, <laughs> there's probably some other worms too, to, maybe the dill worm if it's on dill. Um, I, I, this again is one thing, uh, some years I got a lot of them, some years I don't. I happen to, to uh, I, I grow, I have a lot of Queen Anne's lace growing around me. so. Quite often, if I find this, I will, um, if it's only a few, I'll take them over to the Queen Anne's Lace, but if they get to be too many, I'm sorry, there's not going to be too many black swallowtail butterflies, but there's more carrots next year. So um, yeah, it, it, it's slow moving, it's out in the daytime, uh, it, it really blends in with a, with a carrot leaf if you've got a, a good foliage. Um, but if you get a, a pretty bad infestation, it will really defoliate them and, and um, Throw the growth back as well as the sweetness of the carrots, I think. Any other comments? Every year we plant uh, curly leaf parsley just for the swallowtail. Uh, they prefer that? Great. They seem to go on to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. 
uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a member of the Lepidoptera family, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, when I, this time of year, I, I grow uh, fall uh, brassicas, the cabbage and, and kale and broccoli, et cetera. Uh, and when I, when I give that a BT spray, now I'm, I'm giving the um, carrot tops a, a BT spray too. Um, uh, so I guess I'm stopping them in the tracks. And I really haven't seen any this year, um, but some years are really bad. Yeah, I've been growing my carrots under row covers just to protect them. Okay, okay Laura. Uh, uh -huh. That is a cabbage plant, by the way. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a hint. <laughs> yes, uh, ported cabbage worm. Uh, uh, there's several actually that are similar. There's a cabbage looper, and I can't remember the. Th there's a third one. This is the most common one. Uh, it's the uh, larva of the white um, butterfly. It's a butterfly with a black spot on its on each of its wings. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, if you grow anything uh, in this family of uh, brassicas, uh, they'll be around, they smell it, and they find the plants when they're really small. I start my own seedlings on my front porch um, in the beginning of July, and by a couple weeks later, they found it, and they've already laid their eggs. The eggs are already chewing. Um, BT, uh, again, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, about every 10 days, 10 days to two weeks, um, works pretty, works quite well. I actually alternate um, with um, spinosad. That's the other bacterial spray that I uh, mentioned earlier. It's more of a broad spectrum, so it could be more harmful to um, uh, beneficials. But I don't want the, the cabbage worms to build up resistance too. So I, I alternate. And I think Mary mentioned neem. Um, that, that would probably work too. I, I actually haven't tried neem on this. Anybody have a comment on that? No, I use row covers because that the whole brassica family is one that doesn't need pollination. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. And so you'll leave those on pretty much the harvest? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Okay, Laura. Uh, okay, so here's the adult. <laughs> we don't need to, whoops, we don't need to uh, linger on the adult. Go ahead. Next one. Ah, friend or foe? Ha! Huh. That's our friend, isn't it? Yes. Yep. <laughs> You're answering too, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the lava of the uh, the ladybug. Um, I was chasing one of these. I was chasing one of these this morning out of our salad mix that she kept <laughs> jumping on the next leaf, and I was like, "You don't want to be in there." That's right. Yeah. Run away, fly away home. Yeah. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Uh, and pretty much they'll keep coming. I mean, I, I don't, I think the ladybugs have several generations a year, if I'm not mistaken, but I, I, I don't know for sure. And there's different species of ladybugs too, so, but they're all beneficial. Okay, Lauren. Ah, friend or foe? Uh -huh. Scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll give you a hint. <laughs> if it's scary, it's not always. I guess the praying mantis looks really scary, but it's the, it's the larva of the, um, uh, a Mexican bean beetle. Very distinctive. You're not going to mistake this for anything else, I don't think. How uh, big is that? What's that? How big is it? Very tiny. Yeah, but they'll grow. I mean, uh, the, the bean beetle, I would say, the adult is a little, it's bigger than a ladybug, not an awful lot bigger. And uh, so these can start out pretty tiny, but then they can grow. They'll grow too. Oh. Okay, Laura. Okay, friend or foe? Foe! Oh, okay. Well, friend. wait a minute now. <laughs> That's not even the answer. Friend and foe. It's a, it's a friend <laughs> of a foe. That's right, yeah. Yeah, if you're on the, the, the uh, tomato talk, the other uh, growing tomato, you, you saw this already. But yeah, it, it's the um, uh, tomato hornworm, tobacco hornworm, it's all the same thing with the uh, predatory wasp on it. And uh, Stephanie, you, you remember the name of the predatory. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm right. that, but, grandma. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a pretty big uh, caterpillar right now, which means it's eaten a lot of tomato leaves. So, uh, you know, it has done damage. Um, sometimes I find them this size and they don't have any wasps on them. I say, well, do I leave it and let, let the wasps find them? Usually they do. 
um, or do I let them eat for another few days and destroy more tomato leaves? So it's always a it's always a toss up. But they're really slow moving. You can actually I can almost hear them chew when they get to be really big. Um, and you'll find them because you walk into your tomato patch and you say, "What happened to all the leaves on that plant?" <laughs> uh, and uh, that that unfortunately means you've got a, a fairly fairly big one. Okay, Laura. Ah. <laughs> Plugs, uh, yep. Uh, so we we've had a wet year. We probably haven't had too much problem. And if you're uh, if you're in your community garden with uh, some out surrounded by other cultivated areas or in a farm, you may not have much problem with these. I happen to live right next to uh, woods, and there's you know the grass kind of a grass meadow between myself and the woods, so they're a real problem. Um, yeah. You, uh, I actually um, didn't realize I was having a problem when we when we first started gardening in this location. Uh, I thought it was late flea beetles because the damage kind of looks the same. There's little holes holes in the leaves, and then I realized uh, I went out at night, and I, I highly recommend every once in a while you go in the garden at night with a really strong oh, flashlight because you find things that you don't find during the day. And I found that my uh, you know, lettuce and, and broccoli leaves were, were covered with slugs. Um, there's several things you can do about these. Um, uh, if you get a small plot and not too much of a problem, I go around with a, um, uh, like a popsicle stick, little jar. I put some vinegar in. Uh, I'm not sure about if the soapy water would work, but the vinegar, white vinegar works right quite well. I put them in there and they, they, they probably are dead in a minute. Um, you're and, pickling. Uh, what's that? <laughs> You're pickling this. Yeah, pickling, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I say, uh, you know, somebody's going to become a million when they find a use for these things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, there is, uh, there, there are other uh, controls. One is called Sluggo. Uh, it's a ferric phosphate. It's allowed for organic. It's available through most uh, seed you know, uh, companies that have organic seed. I'm pretty sure Johnny's, as you order some from my Johnny's, uh, and it comes in little pellets. And so I will surround the whole patch of whatever crop it's at after, which um, this time of year, it's my brassicas, and broccoli and whatever, um, in the pathways. And um, it's, it's really reduced the, the, the um, slug population. Um, there are traps. Uh, they love beer. They love yeast. They, well, they love the yeast in the beer. Uh, so you can set out uh, in kind of half berry uh, small jars or um, small cans with um, beer or um, even a yeast, yeast and water solution will, will work fairly well. I find that they work, but they get a few. <laughs> but uh, since I started using the Sluggo, it's, you know, it's really reduced my population to maybe 10% at the most of what it used to be. I, I had nights when I would, pick, oh, I would pick over 100. Now I have a 30 foot oh. long bed full of brassicas. So um, yeah, and sometimes I go out the next night and I get another 100. So um, I, I you know, again, if you, if you have small enough area, you can handpick, that's fine. Otherwise, you, you, you should think about that sluggo, S-L-U-G-G-O. Uh, we actually have a, we have a question from Glenn. He's saying that uh, he would like to buy a toad to control the slugs in his garden, uh, but I can't find a place that sells them. Uh, do you have any recommendations? I don't. Uh, Agway. Agway in Raritan has it. Really? Hmm. Okay. okay. Toads? <laughs> That's so fun. Yeah. You can he also says, try to attract local toads by making little toad houses, which are like overturned uh, flower pots um, that give them some cover. Um, there are lots, you can look it up online, lots of ways to attract toads so you don't have to purchase them. I'll, I'll Charlie, look for follow up to Glenn's question later on. I, I want to get to one of the other slides too. Sure, um, but uh, before we do, Charlie, do you mind repeating uh, the store that you said that you could acquire them from? It's Agway in uh, Raritan, New Jersey, Somerset County. Thank you. Here, I'll, I'll see if I can find a link and post it in the chat for you, Glenn. Okay, Laura. Ah, friend or foe? Oh, oh. Yeah, foe, it's a thistle. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's a perennial. Uh, best way to handle it is when it's young, uh, get as much of the root as you can. Don't chop it up with a rototiller because you'll chop it into 100 pieces, which will all start growing again. 
Um, but uh, those little um, dandelion pullers, I think they're called, um, they work well. It'll probably grow back, uh, but you get it two or three times. And uh, uh, usually you, you've, you've uh, uh, depleted the, the uh, roots, the, the root reserves. So it can do a pretty good job of killing it or killing most of it. Okay, Laura. Ah, friend or foe? Friend. Yeah, friend. Uh, this, uh, Stephanie mentioned this. Uh, the, it's, this is Queen Anne's Lace. It's an umbelliferae. Not only do I put my, um, my uh, uh, carrot, carrot worms over here, um, but you can see, if you look closely, there's a lot of, there's a lot of insects there. Um, it's, a, it's a nectar source for a lot of beneficials. And I don't know what those insects are, but I'm going to guess some of them are beneficials which are probably going back to the garden and eating, eat, eating eggs uh, of, uh, or aphids or, or something like that, or par maybe parasitizing the um, uh, tomato hornworm. Um, but uh, if you've got these growing around inside your fence, outside your fence, um, it's, it's, it's a real benefit. Okay, Laura. Ah, friend. I got to ask Ira, friend yeah. or foe? <laughs> My nemesis. <laughs> Eats all the blueberries. <gasps> yeah. Pretty brazen. Yeah. Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, cat birds, um, they seem to be, they seem to be one, one that does the most damage. Um, so, uh, yeah, again, uh, particularly on fruit, um, uh, they'll, they'll eat all your blueberries, unless yeah. you have something mm. like this. Uh, they'll, they will uh, damage strawberries. Um, they won't pick them off the off the vine, uh, off the vine, but the plant. Uh, the squirrels will do that, but um, uh, they'll they'll peck away at them. Uh, and the same with uh, you know, raspberries and, and about anything, I guess. Um, so, uh, Steph, you gotta you wanna you wanna address a couple of your controls because you you deal with a lot of fruit. Yeah. So the netting is the best, mm -hmm. um, and you have to make sure that you have it on hoops so that the net is not touching uh, the fruit because those little beaks can get right through the holes in the netting and uh, peck at your strawberries. So um, raise up the net uh, by wire hoops and uh, you can protect your fruit that way. And I think you said you've tried, you've had some success, maybe it's on your fruit crop with uh, the, the, the bird tape and the, the big eye, the air, uh, Yeah, it? all of the uh, repellents, uh, the, we have a fake owl, a fake snakes, uh, which scare the heck out of people who come to pick, uh, for you pick. Uh, but it works on the birds for a while, but then after a while, uh, they get used to it. You can now, I think, get some sort of uh, owl that actually turns its head thanks to either a motor or uh, the wind, I'm not sure. Uh, but even so, the birds are very smart mm -hmm. and they have the entire day to sit there <laughs> and figure out, is this a friend or a foe and can I get to that fruit? And so ultimately, <laughs> these uh, scare tactics don't work too well. And they're very friendly bird, <laughs> unfortunately. Those, those owls are they're uh, solar operated, the, one, the heads that move. Yeah. <laughs> I got one and it, it works for a little while, but uh, like you said, they all, the birds learn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With the blueberries, I cover my blueberries with row cover. Oh. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know whether we're da how much damage I'm doing to the plants because you know the the cover's on for about uh, six maybe five or six weeks, mm. so uh, continuously except when I pull it back to pick blueberries uh, maybe about three different times. Mm. Yeah, I have a, ca a caging system that I use for uh, I use components for strawberries, uh, blueberries, and then raspberries. So all the same components, and it's made with one inch chicken wire. And when I started making those, I said, I don't really know that a cat bird cannot fit through a one inch hole. Uh, and, and my answer is it can't. So if you, you know, any, anything, you, your, uh, whether it be your netting mesh or whatever, um, uh, or, you know, wire, wire chicken wire, uh, a cat bird won't go through a one inch hole. 
I think they make that. I think they make chicken wire in two inch holes, and I wouldn't try that. <laughs> I go through that. Yeah. Okay, Laura. Ah, okay. This is part of Greg's. Uh, an, uh, some of an answer to Greg's. Uh, uh, I'll answer it. It's a. It's a friend. It's a. You know. It's a box turtle, wood turtle. I. I think there's actually a difference. I'm not sure. I. I know it, but. Um, uh, I take pictures when I find a new one. I've, I've got nine that I've seen in my in my uh, my property. Uh, and I uh, don't see them too much uh, during the summertime, but spring when they're around mating and laying eggs. And then, but and this is this is right outside my garden. It, it, it can't get in. Um, but this is the area where I think that the slugs are coming from. Um, and I, I when I saw it there, I looked up in my son's reptile uh, book and. Um, Reptile amphibian book, and actually, uh, they listed the three favorite foods of all these an animals, and uh, slugs and snails were uh, among the top three. So I'm sure it's 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 helping a lot. Uh, it's not completely controlling, but uh, it's, it's another one of those uh, you know kind of like the the toad that controls. Taylor. Um, Al, real quick before we move on, it sounds like someone has a television going in the background. Um, I'm not, if you could mute yourself with the background noise, that'd be very helpful. I can't find who you are in, in the chat. I'm so sorry. All right, and I'll, I'll keep going, but I'll try to speak loud. Sure. Okay. Um, you know what, I'm actually going to, I'm going to mute everyone quickly, okay. and then I'll unmute you, Al, so then we don't have right. that background noise. And then Al, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yay. So Sorry I about went that. out in the last few days and took some photos. Uh, well, it's not all these are from the last few days, but uh, tomatoes. Yeah, you can see the bottom leaves are start. They're dying. If they have had um, uh, late early blight. Early. Blight. <laughs> now we get those mixed up. Uh, and the leaves are dying from the from the ground up. Uh, I I my soil is bare. Uh, uh, Stephanie um, had mentioned that that. Um, uh, mulch can help. And go ahead to the next, the next uh, photo, Laura. Uh, okay, this is uh, Sonia Harris, who was uh, co-teaching the tomato class the other day, um, taken about the same day, but she has a heavy mulch, and you can see that sh she doesn't have that splash up of the, uh, the um, spores of that disease. Um, hers are looking a lot more healthy. They may have been planted a little bit later, I don't know, uh, which would give them a little bit of a head start, but um, uh, I keep my soil bare because I want to try to get a cover crop on there real soon. Um, where, uh, you know, Sonia's here, she's going to get a lot of nutrients from her mulch as that breaks down. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a good uh, point for, I might try mulching next year. Okay, Laura. Uh, I believe this is anthracnose. Uh, you'll typically see it. Uh, some varieties are a lot more susceptible. Uh, some are completely susceptible. Uh, uh, Mike, would you agree that's anthracnose? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, this is still edible. You can cut out that spot, but once it gets big enough, it's going to it's gonna ruin the whole tomato plant. Uh, I'm sorry, the whole tomato, the tomato itself. Uh, I don't think it, if it's on the leaf, I'm not sure what it, what it looks like on the leaf, but. Um, and this is really a soil borne thing that to the degree we can keep the soil from splashing on the plant, we're going to avoid its impact. Okay. Good. As much okay. as possible. Yeah. Okay, Laura. Uh, I actually don't know what this is. <laughs> These are my peppers yesterday. Um, if it was on the end, the bottom of the plant, I would say it, it looks a little bit like uh, blossom end rot, but this is not the blossom end. Uh, however, this plant did fall down. Um, Kathleen, uh, you're not the only one that, that had damage in the hurricane. Uh, my soil gets so logged that my, uh, a lot of my pepper plants fell down. So there, I was thinking it might be just some nutritional damage from the falling down. But does, does any other guys want to make any comment, recognize what this is? Or? Until you said it fell down, I was going to say sun scald with an advantageous mold. <laughs> so sun scald first and then the mold would, would, uh, is oh, secondary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I see it once in a while. Uh, it's uh, most of the... Um, uh, peppers on this um, are doing real well. Uh, and actually, it's been a good year for peppers. This is Mike's variety. Uh, what's the name of this, Mike? The long Carmen. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Carmen. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Get nice fruit, nice ripening. Okay, Laura. Okay, um, this is one. You, if you're growing if, uh, members of the cucurbit family right now, um, this is a, a summer squash, but it's powdery mildew. 
Um, it's pretty common. It, you know, I think it's another one that's splashed up in the ground, but it, it'll, it'll spread, but it doesn't necessarily spread from leaf to leaf. You can see there's leaves on either side of it that are uh, perfectly healthy. Um, it means the, the, the plant is going downhill, but it doesn't mean it's over. I mean, it's still, probably still photosynthesizing somewhere on this leaf, but the rest of the plant, particularly the, the new growth, is looking nice and green. Um, there are um, preventive sprays, I guess, for this. Uh, uh, Stephanie, did, you mentioned some, I think, uh, I don't know, sul sulfur or copper or, or rank, uh, Charlie? I've never used it. I figured I'd just let, yeah. let nature um, run. So you can, you can use a neem oil or just a horticultural oil uh, or a bicarbonate of soda, uh, which is sold, uh, or you can just take baking soda and uh, mix it with water and spray that on. Um, so there are solutions uh, to the powdery mildew. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, Laura. Yeah, I was going to say uh, that's a good example for the sanitation practice too. Just grabbing that leaf and pulling it out of your garden. Oh, soon. Pull that okay. Yeah, I haven't been doing that, but it, uh, so actually this is just an example of, of uh, it's the same, same day. Uh, it's a different squash plant. This is uh, a butternut, um, but uh, you can look back uh, behind the fence. You see some yellow leaves. Uh, that's not powdery mildew. I'm not sure if that was from getting too dry or, or whatever, but they're, they're starting to die from there. But the plant is actually putting out a lot of new growth. Um, this is a, a new butternut squash. Butter, uh, winter squash takes about 50 days from flower to maturity. It may be different from, uh, from crop to crop. So I don't know if this is gonna make it, but I did not have a very good year for um, winter squash. Uh, and I've, I've read since then that um, it doesn't pollinate well or produces mostly male flowers uh, when the weather is really hot. I uh, started to get some flowers early on and get some fruit and some, some really nice fruit up there, but not a lot of it. But now it's putting out all these female flowers are getting pollinated. And I don't know how big they're gonna get. I have a feeling I'm gonna have to harvest them before they're, they're um, ideally ripe. So, you know, we may have to just eat them with maple syrup or something like that. But uh, any, any, uh, any comments on, questions on that? So I've used the serenade, not on this, but on the one before the powder, powdery mildew. I've used it on the little mini gourds and I've used it on zucchini and I've used it on cucumbers. It's not perfect, but it helps. It gives me an extra couple of weeks on it. You said it was a serenade, Barbara? Serenade, yeah. It, that's, it's a, it's a, the biologic, it's not BT, it's BS. Yeah. I know. No, so it's it yeah. And um, also, Greg would like to know, uh, is it okay to compost zucchini leaves that have powdery mold or mildew on them? No. You want to get it out unless your compost pile is incredibly hot. You want to um, get it out of the garden because all of that powder are spores and they're just going to spread. Okay, Laura. Stephanie, do you have any idea how long the spores will remain viable? I do not. Because um, I comp I got a separate compost area for that for that type of stuff, and it oh. also has some wood in it, branches and so forth. And it, I'm just wondering. I've never used any uh, any of the material out of it, but I'm, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger with uh, the stuff that we put into it. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know how viable this stuff will be after several years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I actually have to admit I do compost mine, but I also have the disease too. <laughs> but um, I, I find that uh, the damage to the um, summer squash is kind of mineral. It seems to get the older leaves, but this keeps putting out new ones that are healthy and that's where the new fruit's growing. And when, <clears throat> when it comes to winter squashes, um, I only plant butternut. Butternut seems to be in my experience, and, and I haven't tried anything for a long time, but when I did, I was finding the other, a lot of the other varieties like acorn and uh, some of them I haven't, some of the new ones I haven't tried, um, would, would get powdery mildew earlier or it would more kill the plant and, and, and uh, butternut seems to be a little bit more uh, stronger, I guess, resistant, resisting. Um, this is another picture of another butternut squash growing in the compost pile. And again, it's just an example of the leaves. It was yesterday. Um, the leaves are really healthy. I 
I normally don't let things like this grow in the compost pile because, but because I thought it was probably a butternut and because I throw my old butternut <laughs> refuse in the, in the compost pile and I really was short this year on, on I think a butternut squash fruit, I just decided to let it go and I'll see what I get. So, okay, Laura. Ah, uh, okay. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, uh, it, your brassicas this time of year, <clears throat> they're going to have these holes. This was actually not a hole that was eaten this month. This was a, uh, I think when these were seedlings, I was growing on my front porch and I did have some, some cabbage worms that did eat some holes before I actually put some BT on. Uh, and when they get bigger, they'll, they'll get like, like this. I mean, the leaf, this is an original leaf and it's just, the hole's gotten bigger as the plant's grown. So, um, uh, yeah, if you're, if this was kale and you're going to eat that leaf, uh, it's perfect. It's probably perfectly edible. If you're trying to sell it, <clears throat> it may not be sellable. So that's why I, I try to treat about every 10 days to, uh, uh, to two weeks. Uh, okay, Laura, that may be it. Uh, okay. I just want to mention, um, we're talking about, uh, issues. Um, I do grow some melons, and uh, one of the hard parts about melons is trying to figure out when they're when they're ripe. <laughs> um, uh, this is a uh, I, I've grown honeydew uh, for a while, and I was I always grew something that's called honey honey white, I think it is. Um, but then I read that the uh, and it was really it was so hard to tell when it was ripe because it was ripe. I mean, it was white when it was unripe. It was white when it was ripe. But then uh, I, I realized that Johnny's has this honey blonde that will actually turn, uh, you know, this this uh, yellow color when it's getting ripe. So it's it's much easier to say it, it's it's almost there. And with the um, <clears throat> with the melons, uh, particularly the honeydew, uh, it, it still is kind of hard to tell. But if you uh, on the left hand side, the, the stem is on the right, upper right, and the um, probably the blossom end would be on the left. And that blossom end will get a little bit soft. When it's hard as a rock, it's not ripe. But when you start to feel a little bit soft, it's um, it, it's ripe. It, this happens to be one that I tried yesterday, and I started to feel for the first time a little bit of softness. So I may end up picking it tonight. And um, if you have uh, any animals nearby, raccoons love these things. And so that's the that's another way to tell when they're ripe. If you just leave them out and let the raccoons eat them, you know they were ripe the night before. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I, I have these flashing lights that are called night guards and they're available in a lot of garden supply stores. I know Rosedale Mills uh, carries them, uh, which is in Mercer County. Uh, and they're a flashing strobe light that's uh, solar, solar operated and it'll tell you how to put them up in the garden. It says you need four, you really don't, but I think you probably should have two, one facing each way. And I started using those in the middle of the season two years ago where I'd already lost two or three melons and then I've not lost a melon since. So it was definitely worth the investment. I think that's the last slide. Thank you, Al. Uh, yeah. We're oh, getting yeah. very, very late. So I, th I think uh, we should go to the chat box, Amanda. Yeah, sure. And absolutely, if anybody would like to unmute yourself and, and chat with us as well, please do if you have a question. I'm just scrolling up to see uh, what other questions we have in the chat. I just replied to the compost question about is it okay to compost the zucchini leaves that have powdery mildew? Yeah. This is always a tricky question because compost kind of can take so many forms. Um, the compost that really controls diseases, kills uh, weed seeds and things like that, it has to get up to a high temperature. I think 140 degrees is, is what the compost standards call for. Uh, but then it's got to get to that 140 degrees and stay there for a while. Um, you know, three days would be, you know, so you would turn your pile with the right mix and you'd get up to that temperature and it would maintain that temperature. In that case, I think you'd be killing your molds and you could reuse that compost again. But if it's a cold pile and it's not really that broken down, then it might be the same as the mold in the soil and it might still be viable. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I uh, actually, I do have a question um, from Lewis. Do uh, our garter snakes a friend or a foe? I say friend, I think they're so cool. Friend, for sure. Oh, good. 
It depends on, on um, what you're trying to control. But um, if you have voles and moles and mice and even rats, it's really nice to have snakes around. I have a question. I'm not really familiar with the uh, how to hit the chat button, but is there any source for larva for beneficial butterflies in New Jersey? I have a friend that um, takes those larvas, puts them into a screen box, and grows them to fruition because he likes to uh, help the uh, population out. I've never heard of a source of them. We've got a, a neighbor who's coming monitoring a patch of milkweed that we've got out in our field and she's found a couple, um, I guess you'd call them beneficial butterflies. Um, you can contact uh, the Watershed Institute in Pennington, New Jersey. They have a butterfly house and every year they have a big release of butterflies which means that they have been growing them from the chrysalis stage and they're ready to be released as butterflies. So you can find out from them where they uh, purchase their chrysalis. Okay, Watershed in Pennington, you said, right? Watershed Institute. Mm -hmm. Institute, okay. Thank you. So uh, I have um, a question. This is an animal pest control question. Alvin and the chipmunks have set up residency in my garden. Um, I, I see pecks on tomatoes that are like a couple of feet above the ground. Somebody said the chipmunks can climb the tomatoes. I've tried fencing. I've tried the uh, pinwheels. I also have um, uh, gardeners up in New Hampshire, whatever it is. Um, they sell, it's called scat mat. It's plastic with little spikes on it. That doesn't seem to help. Um, I'm afraid of using bird netting because I'm in a community garden and somebody said one of the little finches or goldfinches get caught in it. Mm -hmm. So my question, I guess, Steffi, and, and that's a nice futon because I think I have the same one. Um, it, if I use something like, um, you know, um, pepper, you know, spray it with cinnamon or, or hot pepper or <clears throat> hot pepper flakes all over the place, if I use some kind of spray like that on the tomatoes, is that flavor going to get into the tomatoes? And do you think something like that might work? Um, well, there is a special hot pepper wax um, that's meant for um, animals rather okay. than insects. And it is much more powerful than uh, the hot pepper that's used for insects. And um, that can be uh, a good repellent but then you would have to wash those tomatoes really well to get it off. Um, another uh, uh, thing that you might try is you can buy coyote urine. Uh, okay. is, it's in a powder form and sprinkle that on the ground and that sometimes can repel. But I've had tremendous success with my have a heart traps and those chipmunks just love peanut butter. So okay. you might put yeah, some I, peanut um, butter. I, I'm in a community garden, so we're not allowed to trap and release. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. So uh, if I if I got that um, the the hot pepper thing, if I sprayed at the bottom or below where the tomatoes are, will that mm -hmm. almost kind of keep a barrier to keep them from? It, will they climb up a tomato plant? Yeah, they're they're very nimble, mm -hmm. okay. very agile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you would have to do the whole plant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Amanda, are there any other questions? Oh, uh, let's see. I think the solar lights are a problem. Um, I have a question. Um, and it kind of relates to the previous person. I'm Terry in Union. And um, this is the first year I've grown vegetables in containers. And I put in some solar lights that shone up on the leaves at night. And it looks pretty scary. And I have not had the squirrels are uh, coming in to take the fruit. So I'm wondering if anyone else has ever used that and if it's effective. <laughs> and also if it may be uh, uh, doing damage to the plant by having light on it all night, even though it's not a full spectrum light. Hmm. 
Well, <laughs> worlds and, and chipmunks are not nocturnal. So oh, okay. I don't think it would have much of an effect on them. It might have an effect on other, other pests. Okay. And as far as the damage from too much light, yeah, I, I don't know about that. Could I guess I'll keep going then. I'll try it. <laughs> Continue to try it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, next year you can let us know. <laughs> Gary, have you had fruit, uh, the fruit setting on the tomatoes? Like, yes. You... Yeah, we've had some, some nice cherry tomatoes. Not a huge amount, uh -huh. you know, but um, yeah, pretty nice. I think the hot weather has been more of a detriment, and I have some... Um, I don't know what I have. If it's late blight on the tomatoes, they turn kind of, the, the, the foliage has turned purplish and dried up. So I took all that foliage off and put it in a garbage bag and put it out. And it seems like the tomatoes are, plant, are sprouting new foliage. So that's kind of nice. I mean, I hope that works. Sorry, I'm muted. It wouldn't have been late blight then. <laughs> Okay, I don't know what it was, but uh, it's coming. It is, it may be some spore related item because it is affecting some of the new leaves. So I'm pulling that off as soon as I see it. That sounds like your best bet. Yeah, either that or you could try a copper spray. Yeah, I'll try that too. But yeah, if anyone else has used the solar lights or if you want to try them in your community garden, oh no, it wouldn't work with squirrels, you said. Mm -hmm. But it might work with other nocturnal animals, you think? Well, the, the, the guard that I use is a flashing light. Um, and I think that um, if you've ever uh, looked at a blinking light from far away, uh, when you when it blinks the second time, it looks like it's moved, but it hasn't. It's just your eyes have moved. So I think that's the principle with the, with the flash. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean ra you know raccoons and um, well possums, uh, woodchucks are day feeders, but the, the uh, raccoons uh, you'll have trouble with your sweet corn if you grow any, and also melons. And I, I have it in, in the chicken yard, and it has oh, yeah. um, kept the predators away. Uh, you have to put it at eye level for um, whatever animal you're trying to um, mm -hmm. dissuade from coming to your area. Can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie has uh, talked about a lot of uh, pest control, and so has Al. And it seems to me that a lot of your examples are effective in small gardens, but in large uh, areas uh, may be impractical. And I wonder if Mike could comment about how he controls uh, diseases and pests, because I believe he has uh, many acres under cultivation, uh, as opposed to um, Al and Steffi. Uh, I'll just try make a attempt, quick attempt at it. The the um, one of the primary things is the sanitation. So as a commercial grower, we do not try to keep crops in the ground for a long time. I think as an organic grower, we're limited. That's one of the limitations compared to a conventional grower, is that we don't have the ability to keep the plant living vigorously for a long time in an artificial environment it's going to succumb to some pest or some disease. So that becomes part of our strategy is we grow, we try to provide a good environment for the plant to grow. We try to get the growth to happen quickly and happily. We try to maximize our harvest and then we mow it down, plow it in. We don't, we're trying to reduce tillage. So we're not doing so much tillage. We're basically mowing down a crop like the, the Mexican bean beetles is a good example. We've had many times where the bean populate, the Mexican bean population is damaging the beans. And at that point, we just mow it down, even if there's crop to pick. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, it's not a, not a great answer. The re, I've seen great results with remay on a large, you, you know, the thin agricultural fleece that mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie was talking about. Uh, covering brassicas and things like that. Um, 
we don't use that too much, but I have stopped getting a lot of kale and stuff like that because if I don't want to spray, um, I lose a lot of it to the insects. So the spraying is a real thing. It's happening on a large scale out there for in agriculture, even in organic, to control um, things like the cabbage worms in the fall. Um, what what squashes, Mike? Do you uh, do you grow? And uh, is uh, is there a particular winter squash that uh, is easier to grow in large acreage like yours, or um, are they all sus more or less susceptible to the same? We, we we don't have great ground for winter squash because it tends to uh, sit wet after after rain. Um, Al, was it butternut that you were? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so butternut is real reliable. Uh, delicata, we've got a crop of delicata out there. It has the benefit of growing fast and producing a lot. Um, we've got real vigorous skin out there, but I, um, Al's comment of not a lot of production struck me as, oh, I, I bet that's what's going on. I bet that high, high, hot temperatures we had uh, reduced the the crop production so the yield will be lower even though the plants are looking great Thank you. so we also have um, a question that's now being discussed in the chat room about crop rotation and the usage of cover crops um, it sounds like some people are using rye or field peas but uh, what are your recommendations with rotating your crops and then what kind of cover crop would you recommend to use it sounds like a few uh, people are using raised beds in community gardens and in their own personal garden as well. Al, oh. do you want to take that? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, uh, that, would, that would be a 20 minute answer because there's all kinds of different situations. I mean, the most common, the most common cover crops are fall cover crops. So, so they use when the, the crop is harvested, uh, taken out of the ground, and the ground's gonna be bare over the winter time. And certainly uh, rye, uh, or any of your grasses actually, your, your green grasses, rye, uh, wheat, um, oats, oats, yeah. Oats is a little different, but um, yeah, oats too, uh, can be planted in the fall. And now's a, now's a good time to plant them, uh, if, you've, if you're still growing things. Um, you saw my tomato, plants with the leaves were open on the bottom. I'm going to, in a couple of days, I'm going, to, I'm going to plant a cover crop in there. It's going to be, um, it's going to be rye and vetch, um, which are kind of your standards. But um, I, uh, you know, again, it depends on the situation. Um, if, if I planted oats in there, saw the crop of oats, or let's say oats, and, and there's something called uh, field pea radishes, and uh, not field pea, uh, field radishes, I believe, uh, cover crop radishes. Um, those would both die over the winter time. So if you had a, a, an area where you wanted to plant real early, you could plant those and they would die. So the, the um, uh, beds ready to plant a lot earlier in the spring, a lot, a lot easier to manage. Um, the summer cover crops, I just chopped a, co a crop of, um, of buckwheat. Uh, buckwheat is a quick growing uh, a summer cover crop, takes about five weeks, but it, it creates a dense foliage. So it, it really holds back the weeds. And this bed is going to be a cover crop next year. It's going to be out of production. So I just yesterday I just plant planted um, uh, <clears throat> clover and oats. And normally I would have just planted clover, uh, but I went to one of the summer no for summer conference workshops a few weeks ago, and they said that, that the uh, combinations are always better. And I should have thought of that because I'm actually an, an organic inspector. So I see a lot of, of um, you know, grains and stuff like that planted in my inspection work. And they usually do plant a grass when they plant clover or alfalfa. And so I've been kind of struggling sometimes with getting those, those uh, crops to, those long-term crops, the clovers and, uh, to grow, uh, to germinate. Actually they germinate really well, but they'll, they'll dry out um, very quickly if they, uh, have a dry spell for three or four days. So the, um, the uh, oats will grow faster, it'll shade them, uh, and, and it's kind of a, a good combination. Now the problem with that is uh, you got to plan ahead. Uh, I've been growing cover crops for a long time, so I have a small container, a small coffee uh, 
coffee container in my basement that has all these cover crops in them. And it's, I probably have seven or eight of them. And so I know at a certain time I want to use this one and I'll, I'll use it, but I have to plan ahead and order those when I order my seeds. Uh, you can get fairly small amounts from Johnny's, but some of the things like oats, um, you can get locally and, 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 and actually you can use feed oats for horses. There's probably more weeds in it than, than there would be, but uh, it would be perfectly fine. Uh, if you can't find a, a, a garden supply store that has cover crop rye or wheat, you can go to the health food store and get wheat berries. Um, you know, they're, a little, they're more expensive, but they, they work. And if that's, if you don't need that much of them. It's not a bad way to go. I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> So I think we're just about to go a little bit over time. So I wanted to thank uh, our garden doctors for joining us this evening on uh, answering all of our questions. I'm sure if anybody has any follow-up questions that they did not have answered, you can send it to our NOFA um, email address and we can connect you to uh, the amazing individuals who have the answers this evening. So I, I also wanted to make an announcement on behalf of Charlie West, because Charlie has an, an unbelievable pawpaw farm up north. Um, and, uh, and so if anybody would like pawpaws, um, please email Charlie, because he he's going to have an amazing crop. And normally we do a fall workshop there, but this year we can't. So, <laughs> so if you need to get some pawpaws, which you, you probably do, they're so delicious. Um, reach out to Charlie. And also, if you're interested in getting trees from Charlie, you can look his site up. Charlie, what's your site name exactly? I can't remember now. Uh, it's, it's a Google website. I don't know what the name is. But, uh, <laughs> my email address, my email address is very easy. It's wcwest at gmail.com. Charlie? Oh. Charlie, the, the uh, pawpaws are, uh, are more of a southern fruit, is that correct? Uh, well, not really. No? Uh, they're not native. You, won't, you don't find them, or at least I've never found them in New Jersey, but you do find them in, in Pennsylvania yeah. and uh, Virginia, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, right. Michigan. So right. they're, uh, they have a pretty big distribution. There's a town in West Virginia by the name of Papa. Also in Michigan. Mm -hmm. but, but anyway, the reason I ask is, is I wonder, since this has been a very warm summer, whether your crop seems to be more productive this year than previous years. Uh, no, it's probably going to be less productive because right. if you remember back uh, around the 20th of April, we had a, uh, actually I had three nights out of, three out of four nights where the temperature was down to about 26 or seven and uh, the, the, the trees were flowering at the, that time. Uh -huh. So we lost, we lost a lot of the flowers, the early flowers. The interesting thing about pawpaws is unlike some of your other fruits, they flower over a, about a, a four or five week period of time. Wow. So the later flowers came on and uh, uh, are pollinated, but uh, the early flowers were all lost. Yeah. I used to go fishing in Pawpaw Creek in West Virginia. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fishing for pawpaws, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry, excuse my advertisement, but I think that Charlie is an incredible grower of pawpaws. He's such an expert. So I, I hope you'll all support him and, and reach out to him for some pawpaw fruit this year. And, uh, and hopefully next year we'll all be able to get together for a celebration in the fall. All right. Yes, I'm ready for that. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so tomorrow's our last night. Um, a lot of vegetarian vegan recipes from the Whole Earth Center. Um, they're a great supporter of organic farming in the area. And so I hope you'll tune in and watch Chef Sean, who is a vegan chef. So he, uh, most of his recipes are quite focused on that um, preparation style. All right. Yes, and on the uh, reminder email tomorrow, we're having another Festimato cocktail hour from our friend Vic from the Laughing Fox down in southern New Jersey. So we have two tomato themed cocktails for you to try out while you're enjoying your class as well. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Have a lovely Thanks. evening. Me too. Bye. 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 Thank you.